talk about hydrangeas. As Josh said, this has always been a popular topic. It was a lot more fun when we did it in person because we had the plants there. You could touch and feel them and get a close up view, but we're gonna try and make this the best we can on your screen. Um, hopefully you're gonna learn some things about hydrangeas, what you can do to better grow them and maybe see a few new varieties that have just come on the market that you may want to add to your garden. So let's get started. There are many types of hydrangeas, but the most common are about five of them. And they are the macrophylla, which when you say hydrangea, most folks think of the macrophylla. That's what's pictured here. It's the mop head hydrangea, the one that kind of warms the cockles of your heart, may remind you of your grandmother's garden. Um, that's the macrophylla. Arborescence is the smooth hydrangea, sometimes called Annabelle. Again, another great hydrangea for the garden. Cursifolia or the oak leaf hydrangea, commonly known because the leaves have the oak leaf tree type shape, um, which is a native. The paniculata, which is for you all that are growing in a very sunny location, paniculata may be your hydrangea of choice. And the last one is Anomala or Pitiolaris. That is the climbing hydrangea. So we're gonna go through each of these different types. I will talk about the cultivation, pruning, fertilizing, and then at the end, we'll go over some of the newest varieties in each of these. So the macrophyllas, there's several different um, flower form types on these. The mop head, which is what we think of mostly, um, the big pom-pom type balls that you see on them. But there's also the lace cap hydrangeas, um, also very pretty. And then, although I have this on the macrophylla site or webpage here, it's the hydrangea serrata, which is actually a different type of hydrangea, but it has a lot of similar characteristics to the macrophyllas, which we'll kind of talk about a little bit further on. Um, but it also has the lace cap blooms as well. So like I said, two bloom styles, mop head and lace caps. Your older hydrangeas, your older macrophyllas, many of those bloom on old wood. So if you dug out a hydrangea out of your grandmother's garden and planted it in your yard, most, more than likely it is probably one of those that blooms on old wood, which just means last year's growth. And so for situations like we had this year where we had a late freeze, those old bloom, old wood blooming type hydrangeas, sometimes you'll lose your flowers for that year, which is kind of disappointing. But there's a lot of new breeding that's been done and they have created hydrangeas that now are remontant, which just means they bloom on old and new wood. And these are blooming right now. These are start blooming. Mine has just started popping recently, you know, early to mid um, June is really their prime time um, for them to be in bloom. And they'll, if they're remontants, you'll get several, you might get several flushes, so it can last until fall. And even the flowers that have matured and are still on the plant still have some beauty to them to just leave them on. And macrophyllas, they do prefer some afternoon shade. Their favorite location is morning sun, afternoon shade. If you have an Eastern exposure on your house, that would be a prime location for a macrophylla. Um, they do not like to be in the hot afternoon sun. If that's where you have it planted, you may see them wilting or flagging as we like to say. And it may not be that they're dry. It may just mean that um, it's too hot and their leaves are transpiring. And as they're doing that, they're flagging or they're wilting. So it stresses them out. So you probably won't have a very good looking macrophylla if you've got it getting some hot afternoon sun. So you definitely want to get morning sun on those or in an area that gets dappled sun throughout the day, like a high canopy of trees. Macrophyllas also are affected by the acidity of the soil. And as you may know, the color of the bloom is affected. It's more blue in acid soils, which we have here in Georgia and a more alkaline soil will give you a pink color. Now, these particular hydrangeas like water, hydrangea, hydro, water. So they demand water, especially when they're newly planted. Um, they're not gonna do 
well in a drought situation, you would have to supplement water because macrophyllas definitely need to have some water. They don't need to be in a swamp, but they definitely need to stay moist. So as I said, the macrophylla color in acid soils are blue. Now I am a pink person. I like pink blooms. And so what I've done with some of mine is I grow, if they're the more compact variety, I like to grow them in containers because I can control the soil pH better than I can in the soil in my garden bed. Um, now you might buy a pink hydrangea in the store thinking you're gonna have a pink hydrangea and it may stay pink maybe the first year, but usually by the second or third year, that hydrangea bloom will be will be blue here in the Georgia clay soil. So again, for me to be able to kind of manage the color to the more pink, I do it in a, you know, a more balanced potting soil that has more of a neutral pH um, to do that um, much more easily. Now, if you like blue, great. You're gonna be very happy here in Georgia because you will have some blue flowers on your hydrangeas. A lot of people complain that they, they have hydrangeas in their yard, but they don't bloom. And there can be a few reasons for that. Um, like I said, the late spring freeze, you may not have blooms if it got cold enough and it froze those tips off and it may not be a remontant. It may just be one that blooms on old wood and therefore you wouldn't have any blooms that year. Also in proper pruning, um, there are certain times of the year that you should prune a hydrangea. I don't recommend pruning hydrangeas. Um, you should be growing it in a location where you let it get to its full you know, size. Now there are reasons to prune obviously, but um, if you let the landscaper lose after August 1st uh, and he goes in and hedges your hydrangeas because he thinks they look out of whack, you may be cutting off blooms for next year. Also, like I said, said they do like shade, but they, they need light. They can't be in the deep shade of your forest and really perform well. So you may have little to no blooms if they're not getting enough sunlight. And again, that Eastern exposure uh, is, is a great place to put a macrophylla. Also too much fertilizer. Now, a lot of us think, oh, more fertilizer, more blooms. Not necessarily <laughs> in this case. You could have if you really over fertilize, you'll have a lot of beautiful green leaves, but you may not have many flowers. All that nitrogen is being taken up into the leaves and you're not getting the flowers um, that you want out of your, your mop heads. And if any of you have been in the big box stores or nurseries in the past 10 to 20 years, you're probably very familiar with the endless summer family of hydrangeas. This is a proven winners. Um, hydrangea and very popular and for good reason. They're, they're great performers here in the Southern Garden. Um, it's interesting that many of these plant breeders and distributors, if they have a lot of marketing, you really know about them. And so they, they succeed. Now in my presentation here, I've used um, a lot of proven winners. Um, there's a new one out there, Bloomin' Easy, um, but there are many more out there. They just don't have the marketing dollars really for people to know about them. But these are great. Um, Endless Summer was the first one. And then I think Blushing Bride came second. Blushing Bride stays a nice white color. It may tinge blue or pink depending on the soil. But if you're looking for a white hydrangea, I, I have Blushing Bride in my garden and it always does great. Um, if you're a Lace Cat fan, Twist and Shout is a beautiful one and it gets the heads get quite large on that. If you look, the pink flowers are actually the infertile fluorescence and the fertile flowers are those in the center that you can barely see. That's really where the um, fertile part of the flower is. And Bloomstruck came out after that. Um, it does well in the garden. It gets a good size. All of these get good size. So if you have the space, um, so you don't have to prune them, they're great ones for the garden. They came out with another one, I think in the last two or three years, Summer Crush. Um, I think that one might be a little bit smaller in stature and a really saturated color on the flowers. Very pretty. A couple of lace caps that I have in my garden that I really like, um, I thought I'd bring up here. Wedding gown on the left, um, it is always white. So again, if you like white flowers, it's a great one. Um, it, to me, it looks like lace. And it always seems to do well. I don't have issues with it not blooming. It's a, it's a nice one and it's of smaller stature. And the one on the right, I had 
seeing this when it first came out and I just had to have it because if you see the size of the blooms and you can see the size of my hands, which my hands are not small by any stretch, how large that bloom is. And I think I actually drove to North Georgia to a nursery to buy this particular hydrangea because I just thought it was the most beautiful large lace cap that I'd ever seen, but it is a, a very nice one. So the Let's Dance here is, again, this is a new series by Proven Winners. They're usually bringing out one a, a year um, and they tend to be smaller in stature. So again, I've kind of listed some of the ones that have come out recently. Again, the two to three feet tall range and they are rebloomers. So, you know, you don't have to worry about losing them to a, a late freeze. Um, but I have a few pictures here on my next page. Rave is one of the more recent ones that they've, and it has a very deep color, it, almost like purple here in our gardens with the acidity in the soil. Um, the Let's Dance Speak Easy has very large mop head blooms, um, blue jangles. Again, you know, it could be pink, but here it's blue. So um, just a nice mop head. And then the Let's Dance Starlight, that is another lace cap. And as I mentioned, the hydrangea serrata, it is a different type, although it does have some of the same characteristics as the mop heads. Um, it does change color based on the soil, and um, but it is a little bit more cold tolerant. So when we've had later freezes, this one still produces blooms. Now the blooms are smaller, but there's a lot of them. And um, it, it different from the macrophyllas, the leaves are much smaller and narrower. Um, which is, you know, just something different. It's just a smaller statured hydrangea, much um, more petite, I guess you'd say, um, but a very pretty one. And it does well down here in Georgia. And um, if you like lace caps, it's a great one to have. This one here is Tiny Tough Stuff. The first one was Tough Stuff. Um, tough Stuff gets about four to five feet, Tiny Tough Stuff, two to three. And they have a new one called Tough Stuff Aha. Um, again, it's two to three feet, but the fluorescence, those infertile fluorescence around the center are a bit bigger. I think I have a picture here later on in my presentation. The next type of hydrangea, arborescence or the smooth hydrangea and commonly called Annabelle. Now, Annabelle actually is a cultivar, but it's almost synonymous with the arborescent hydrangeas. Um, and these are ones that actually bloom on new wood. Um, they are native actually. Now, if you saw one in the woods, you probably would say that's not a hydrangea. I mean, obviously the flowers are much smaller, much sparser, but it is, has been bred to produce the larger blooms. And these can take a lot more light than the macrophyllus can. Um, their blooms, they come out, they emerge green, and then they turn to white. Now they used to only be white, but the plant breeders have come out with pink, which makes me very happy um, because I like my pink flowers. And because this blooms on new wood, you're guaranteed to have flowers um, in the springtime. And even if you deadhead during the summer after the initial blooms have, are spent, um, you will get a reflush of blooms later on in the season. So it is a great hydrangea for those of you who just think macrophyllas are too much work and they're too much of a diva in the garden. Using the arborescents are always a good choice. And here are a few, Annabelle on the left, Incredible, which this one probably does not do Incredible justice. Those blooms can almost get to be basketball sized. Um, they also are very heavy. And they have come out with Incredible too. As these plant breeders, you know, realize um, that some of these flowers are so heavy, the stems can't support them. They start breeding um, to, for, for a more sturdier stem. I have the Incredible in my garden. I have to stake it up. I have to, you know, put stakes around it and then, you know, kind of tie twine just so that when we get a heavy rain, they stay standing. Uh, it is, but it's worth it because it is such a pretty one. Invincible Limetta is a um, arborescence that kind of stays this lime green color. It never gets to that real white color um, that the Incredible and the Annabelle do. And here, like I said, is the pink ones that they've bred. Now there's others out there. There's Invincible Ruby, Invincible uh, Blush, 
And this one, when it was first created, and I'm guessing it's still happening, a dollar of every one of these goes to breast cancer. I have Invincible Spirit. There's now an Invincible Spirit too. And I think I also have the um, Incredible Blush in my guard. And then the Mini Ma Vet is a smaller statured um, pink arborescence. The Invincible Wee White is the smallest of the arborescence. And it is a heavy bloomer. It's two to three feet high. And I think it's a great one for the smaller gardens. Um, because it is such a, a great bloomer and, and just covered in blooms. This is my garden. Um, on the left is Incredible, and to the right of that is Invincible Spirit. As you can see, they can get to be a good size. Um, this is when they're just starting to bloom. So this is probably early June, late May, early June that year that I took this picture, um, but always a guarantee to have lots of blooms in the, in the right conditions. Our next type is the cursifolia hydrangea or the oak leaf hydrangea. Again, named because of the leaves that are kind of the oak leaf shaped. This also is a native. Now the ones in the native you know, woods do not look like the one here in the picture. They're much smaller panicles. They're much more sparsely flowered, but they're fertile flowers. They have a lot of those. Now, obviously for the pollinators, um, they, they don't need the, the showy blooms like they've bred bred for. So this one blooms on old wood. So again, you need to be careful when you're cutting back your, or if you decide you want to cut back your hydrangeas, um, be careful that you're not taking off next year's blooms. I love the cursifolia hydrangeas. I call them the king of the um, hydrangeas, and I call the macrophylla the queen of the hydrangeas. The reason I call them the king is they're much larger um, the leaves are much bigger. They're much more coarse and leathery. It just, you know, I just associate that with the, uh, the king and obviously the queen diva, the macrophylla. They have four seasons of interest. Um, spring, obviously, they're blooming now. Uh, summer, they, the panicles will turn to a creamy pink um, color. So, and that carries on till fall. In the fall, the leaves turn a beautiful like rust mahogany orange color and they, they kind of stay on the plant through the winter, but the plant trunk or stems are also peeling um, like a peeling bark. So it adds another level of interest in the winter time. So I have these in the back of my perennial border and um, they kind of really light up the back border once they're in bloom. They can take drier conditions um, and sunnier conditions than the macrophylla. They are not one that want to be have wet feet. Obviously, they need moisture, but once they're established, they are very little attention are required on these. They're great to have in your woods um, or along the edge of your woods. And um, this one in the picture is called Little Honey. It has been bred for its leaf color, which kind of comes out in this bright yellow and then kind of fades to a lime green. So it kind of lights up the shadier areas of your um, yard. And I just ordered this one the other day. I had one before and I lost it. So I just added this one to my wish list. Crucifolias tend to be large plants, but they have been bred down to smaller plants. Ruby slippers is about a four foot plant. Here it looks a lot larger than that, but it is really, it's not that big. Um, I think it's just the direction of that photograph. Sykes dwarf is another dwarf hydrangea. Um, the snow queen and snowflake are both good size. They're usually five to six feet range or more. I have snowflake. I love the double blooms on the infertile flowers um, and the panicles can get quite long. It's, it's a very pretty one. And here it is. Here's the back of my perennial border. Um, you see the oak leaves in the backdrop. And to the left is uh, hydrangea cursifolia Gatsby's moon. And I love this one because the florets are so tightly packed on this. And I don't even think this is when it's totally filled out, but it is a very heavy, heavily flowered um, panicle. And this one I lost to the chipmunks. Thank you, chipmunks, or the voles. I don't know which. They went in my garden and they ate the roots and used it as a tunnel. So I had to 
get a new one of these for my garden, but it's worth it. Now these blooms are heavy. And so until that plant really gets established, you may have to stake it up. Um, but I just think it's a very unique flower on the cursifolia. And like I said, for those of you that have panicula, have sunshine, um, lots of sunshine, the paniculata hydrangeas are for you. Um, these are panicle, sometimes called panicle hydrangeas. They bloom on new wood as well, and they bloom later in the, the summer. So usually around July, they're starting to come into their own. Um, they're setting up their blooms buds right now. You want to definitely cut those back in late winter, early spring. Um, so you don't cut off anything that's getting ready to bloom. But if anyone knows of limelight hydrangea, it's been around probably for 20 years now. Um, obviously they've done a lot of plant breeding and there's a lot more out there, but the limelights are still beautiful. If any of you know Buck Jones Nursery there on Highway 140, probably 15 years ago, they planted limelights along the highway and they must have gotten so many phone calls from people wanting to know what that plant was. They put on their sign, they're limelight hydrangeas um, because they almost glow in the dark. They are beautiful, but they are large. And so for some of us who have smaller yards, you probably may not have room for a limelight. Although limelight hydrangeas are so big that they are um, sometimes um, created into a standard or a tree form like you see there on the right. It almost looks like a crepe myrtle, but that's actually a hydrangea. The picture in the middle shows you just how big these get and just how many flowers they get on them. Um, they're really something to behold. Some other high paniculatas that are out have been out there in the market, uh, Strawberry Sunday, Little Quick Fire. Quick Fire is uh, the original. It is one of the first blooming paniculatas uh, in the season and um, before any of the others. Pinky Winky is one that I have in my yard and always a pollinator attractor. They love that one, but it is also a pretty good size. Not as big as limelight, but it is good size. And then there is a picture there of the limelight bloom. And the last type is the climbing hydrangea, or the Anomala petiolaris. As you can see here, this one is growing into a large tree. Um, they are vines, they climb, and <clears throat> they have kind of a white, white lace cap flower. They bloom in May and June, July, um, and you can prune these back. You know, a lot of people use these if they have like a brick wall they might use this to climb up the brick wall it does not hurt the brick I wouldn't do it on the side of a house uh, that's you know masonite or something like that but on brick it works it does not harm it um, these can grow up to 60 feet tall no it won't happen in one season um, they first year you think is this thing ever going to grow it kind of sleepy and then the second year it creeps a little bit and the third year it usually kind of takes off and um I don't recommend planting it on a 15 foot tree. You're, I want you to plant this on like a big tall pine tree or a big oak tree would be the place that you'd want to plant something like that. There are two variegated forms of the climbing hydrangea, um, Firefly and Miranda. They're obviously not as strong a grower as the, the green form, um, but they have the beautiful coloring in the early spring. They start to fade a little bit as the summer wears on, but they're not as strong a grower so you can put those easily on a trellis or something like that and it's not going to to break it um it's a they're really pretty i love anything variegated so i like those a lot okay how to plant a hydrangea let me get a sip of water here um <clears throat> so you've been to the store you've bought your hydrangea and you get it home you want to dig a hole. You will, first of all, you want to do a little research. How big is this hydrangea going to get? Because like I said, you don't want to have to prune it. Um, you want to make sure it's got plenty of space for its mature height. So uh, if it's going to be four by four, you want to make sure it's got two feet on either side and maybe a little bit more so it's not running into whatever else you're planting. Um, you want to dig the hole as deep as the pot and then you're going to dig it as wide, probably two times the width of the pot. And what I do is I mix the um, native soil with like a planting mix that's specific for you know planting beds. 
and then backfill that in. And then I put bark mulch on top to help, you know, keep the moisture and the weeds down. And that's, that's really, you want to make sure it stays watered. Um, check it, use your finger method to make sure it's moist. Don't just water to water. And um, always, uh, I like to recommend waiting until fall to plant hydrangeas. Of course, that's easily said than done because when you see these in the, the nursery, you wanna see them in bloom and not to plant them just seems like crazy to wait till fall. But if you are gonna plant it in the springtime, you just need to make sure that we're gonna be going to the hot season. You're gonna to have to keep these things watered until they're established. All right, as I've mentioned multiple times now, um, pruning, why to prune, <laughs> the reasons to prune. You don't need to print them annually. Um, again, you wanna put them in a place where they can come to their full size. You do wanna remove dead stems and tips. And every season, my husband says, uh, when are you gonna take care of those sticks out there? Because there will always be some dieback. Um, and usually by this time, if those, as he says, sticks, those, those branches have not shown any green life um, leaves on it, I usually trim those back to the point that there is a leaf. If there are no leaves, I trim it down to the base of the plant. Um, some of these hydrangeas are so vigorous that um, it can be beneficial to actually trim out some stems to allow for airflow um, because any plant is, does better with a little bit of airflow and you're less apt to get any kind of diseases if there can be some air movement around them. And then of course, to reduce the size or reshape. But again, you don't want to do that until um, after August 1st, or you will lose some blooms on these uh, old wood bloomers. The oak leaf and the macrophyllas that bloom on all wood, um, August 1st is your drop dead date. You don't want to do anything after then. If you do, you can. It's just you won't have any blooms next year. The deadheading you can do anytime. Deadheading just means removing the spent blooms. Um, if you want to prune as you are like maybe cutting flowers to bring in the house or whatever, if you want to take the stem down further, um, it's kind of, you know, your way of pruning it down a little bit while you're cutting the stems for um, de decoration, you can definitely do that just to keep the plant in check. Now the arborescence and the planiculonas, like I said, they bloom on new wood. So nothing to worry about here. You want to cut those back in late winter or early spring. You just don't wanna do it right before it blooms. So I usually do it at the end of February to the end of March, I trim mine back. Um, obviously the arborescence bloom earlier than the paniculatas, but I just do them at the same time, it's just easier. And I generally prune them down to about 12 inches from the ground. Um, and you would be amazed how much uh, green grows in that period of time from your cutting it back. You saw what mine looked like and that was pruned down quite severely. Fertilizing hydrangeas, for, they like to be fertilized. Um, again, not over fertilized and using a slow release fertilizer, a balanced like an Osmocote, uh, two to three times a year, March, May and August. You don't wanna do it after August. You don't want to, to signal the plant to put on new growth right before winter. Um, and depending on how big your plant is, is how much fertilizer you're going to use. And you can look on your label, it'll tell you based on the size of the plant, um, how much fertilizer you should be putting down. It's better to under fertilize than over. Like I said, if you over fertilize, you may just get a lot of green and not any flowers. Um, and you never want to fertilize a plant that looks like it's sick or wilted. Hydrangeas do have some diseases and pests. Um, they're not real common. I think probably if a plant is not under stress, is um, well cared for and watered, it definitely resists diseases and you know insects. Um, but I would say probably the most common thing that I hear about hydrangeas is leaf spot. And a lot of that is just caused by our humidity um, or overhead watering. If water sits on the leaves overnight, sometimes you can get the leaf spot. So this um, rub site here has some great information on identifying problems and treating problems. Obviously the Cherokee County Extension Office is also willing to help you. Um, but on the leaf spot, you know, people wanna spray things. I just say, it's usually not on every leaf. Um, 
I usually just pick those leaves off and dispose of them, not on the ground, but, you know, in a trash bag. You don't want to throw it on the ground because it will, you know, the next rain, it'll splash up and you'll just get more leaf spot. You definitely want to dispose of that. This is another website by the University of Florida with their plant pathology department kind of shows um, the different types of diseases that hydrangeas can get and how to treat them. As far as pests, um, again, not super common uh, unless if they're, you know, the plants are healthy. Probably the biggest pest out there is deer. I don't know what to tell you about that other than um, a fence. It's very hard to control the deer. Hydrangeas are one of their favorite. I do know, I don't have a deer problem. I have had rogue deer go through my neighborhood and have, you know, taken my bobo hydrangeas down a couple of times, but I don't have the deer problem that some folks have where they have a herd in their yard. Um, deer off and liquid fence are sprays that you can use. And those would have to be reapplied, you know, after a, a heavy rain. Um, and you can read the labels on how to use those. But I've heard milorganite. I know like Gibbs Gardens puts milorganite out. Now that's on the ground, um, probably helps with the, um, you know, lower plants, but the hydrangeas, when they've got their flowers up four feet high, just at the deer's nose level, it's not gonna do much to prevent the deer from chomping down. So now we're to the favorite part of our um, presentation is the new hydrangeas that are out here um, in the marketplace. And this one here that's shown is the Tough Stuff Aha that I mentioned. That's one of the more recent serratas that have, they've come out with, with the larger bloom uh, and the infertile fluorescent out there. And it supposedly is a heavy bloomer and will bloom all summer. I don't have this one, so I can't speak from experience, but it does look like a very pretty one. I just have the tough stuffs in my yard. And just a few things, as we're talking about what are plant breeders trying to accomplish? I mean, how many possibly <laughs> new hydrangeas can you introduce? What are they working towards? Obviously they want the hydrangea to be a rebloomer, a remontant. Um, they're always trying to get things to be more compact, just knowing, you know, the way of the world and how we have smaller yards and smaller gardens now. They're breeding for disease resistance. Um, they're looking to find blooms that last longer or are colorful, more colorful when they age, they just don't turn brown. Obviously stronger stems to support those blooms. Um, they're looking for unusual leaf color, whether it's variegation or I've, there was a, a hydrangea nut too long ago that had kind of purplish leaves or stem color, um, just so to add some other characteristics besides just the bloom. And obviously they're looking for bigger blooms and unique colors to those blooms. So as I was doing my research um, to do this presentation and find some new ones, I came across this one, which is the first ever cascading hydrangea. It's called Fairy Trail Bride, which I love these marketers. They come up with some great names. Fairy Trail Bride Cascading Hydrangea. It is actually a hybrid of different types of hydrangea. It's not just a macrophylla. It's not just a serrata, et cetera. It is a combination. I think it won the 2018 uh, Chelsea Flower Show. Uh, a Japanese breeder came up with it. It's very long blooming because it blooms at each leaf node and it can get up to four feet tall. They, oh, they say you can use it in a hanging basket. I'm not sure. Um, and it isn't quite as hold hardy as our other like macrophyllas, but it says it's hardy to zone seven. So we should be fine because we are in zone seven. Here's a picture of it um, in a container. It looks just like covered in blooms and this one has the flowers have kind of a serrated edge to them. Of course I had to have one. Um, so I went online and I did order one for myself and I just got it yesterday and I can't wait to try it out. It's, it's always gonna be white. It doesn't change with the alkalinity of the soil. It's always gonna be a white one. So I think it's gonna be quite popular. I'll be interested to see how it's, um, str how strong a grower it is here in the South. And that's part of the difference, you know, 
what grows well in the south may not grow well up north. What grows well up north may not grow well down south. Um, a lot of these new hydrangea breeders are in Michigan. Um, there are some that are down here and you know they, they can be very specific. If they've trialed these down here, they can say these, this does well in humidity or doesn't do well um, and so forth. But I love this one, it's a pretty one. Here's the latest on the Let's Dance series. Um, this one is actually a serrata. So it's a mountain hydrangea. Its flower buds are along the entire length of the stem, not just on the, the ends. And it tends to rebloom quicker than others, they say. It gets about three to four feet tall. Um, they say that the infertile um, florets are the sterile flowers are, just get so big that they kind of cover up the, the infertile. So, I mean, the fertile floret. So it's, I've seen this one in big box stores. I've seen it at the larger nurseries as well. And in a lot of these new, newer hydrangeas, um, you're not going to find them at the Lowe's and Home Depot's of the world. Obviously, you'll find Endless Summer because it's been around forever. But some of these newer ones, you'd have to go to a larger nursery to find, like a Pikes or a Scottsdale. Um, they're going to be the ones that can carry these, these newer varieties. The Wee Bit series um, is new. I think it was actually new last year, but I love the name. Obviously, with the name Wee Bit, it's a compact rebloomer. The naming, I love Giddy and I love Wee Bit Grumpy. Um, Wee Bit Giddy is actually very easy to find. Uh, I even saw this one at like Home Depot. Wee Bit Grumpy, you cannot find this anywhere in a nursery. And so <laughs> it's funny and it's, these are both, they look very similar and maybe they just, the nurseries decide I'm just gonna carry Wee Bit Giddy and not Wee Bit Grumpy, even though I think they get a lot of people that want Wee Bit Grumpy just because of the name. Um, they're about two feet high. They have a very deep color saturation and very green glossy leaves. This one is one that I picked up a wee bit giddy. I have it in a container because I'm trying to stay the pink color. Um, and it's planted with a begonia and a brunera. Um, and it's gonna stay small. So I'm just gonna keep it in the, the container. Like I said, I wanted to get wee bit grumpy. I, I ordered this for my husband for our anniversary because um, it reminds me of him. But again, this is wee bit grumpy. Generally, they show wee bit grumpy in the blue family and they show wee bit giddy in the pink family. But honestly, again, it's all based on the um, pH of the soil. This one is a beautiful one, Hydrangea Frill Ride. This is from Bloom and Easy. As you can see, the flowers are just full and frilly. Um, I've got this one on my wish list as well. It is a compact one. It is a rebloomer. Again, here they show it in the red family, but it would be the blues and purple family in our, our native soil. This one, Hydrangea Kimono. Again, this is you know working towards some different flower colors. This is a two-tone white and either pink or blue. Um, it's a two to three foot wide, so I'd call it a compact grower. I had this one on my wish list, but this one just seems to have sold out. You can't find it anywhere. Um, it seems to be very popular. And a lot of these online nurseries are having sales because it's the end of the season, it's Memorial Day, and they're you know marking down their, their plants and offering free shipping. So I'm not surprised that this one is gone. Hydrangea tilt -a swirl um, again, an interesting flower color, starts out green and then moves to pink and then more pink. Um, it just deepens as it matures. This one's a three to foot tall one. I can now say that I'm the proud odor owner of a tilt -a swirl My husband got me one for my, our anniversary yesterday. Um, and it is, it seems like a strong grower. It's a, it's a pretty one, it's unique. And I'm gonna try it out in my garden and see how we do here in the South. As far as new arborescence on the market, Invincible Lace, this is actually their first lace cap um, in their Invincible line, in their arborescent line. With, if you like lace caps, this one's a kind of unusual one. Um, again, because it's an arborescence, it blooms on new wood. It has ruby red stems, so it has some other, you know, interest into it besides the flower. It's actually a subspecies of the arborescence arborescence subspecies radiata, but it is one of the newer ones that they've introduced. Here's a new oak leaf hydrangea, hydrangea snowsickle. 
Um, again, on my wish list, it's another double flowering oak leaf, similar to snowflake, um, much longer panicles, but it is a smaller um, statured one, four to six feet tall. And they say it has much stronger stems, which it would need because they say that these panicles can get 12 to 14 inches long, but they look magnificent. Um, I think this is one that I need to have in my garden. Now to the new paniculatas and paniculatas have become very popular. I think just because a lot of folks have smaller yards with lots of sun. Um, the firelight tidbit is one of the smallest panicles. Um, it looks about the same size as Bobo, maybe a little bit smaller. It gets two to three feet. Uh, the flowers start green, they go to white and then to a pink. Um, so if you have a small garden, I'm, I actually bought one of these and I'm gonna put it in my perennial border. It's small enough to um, you know, be in the border without overwhelming it. It's a nice size. Little Lime Punch, um, this one is three to five feet tall. Again, the, the big marketing um, push on this one is the bright Hawaiian punch colored flowers as they mature. And I'd like to say that's how yours is going to look, but I just say this in full disclosure that a lot of these panicle hydrangeas that say, oh, it gets bright pink or oh, it gets red when it matures, that in the South, because of the heat of our summers, they don't mature to as deep a color as what they show. Um, up north, they seem to do that because they have cooler nights. And um, I just haven't seen this one yet in real life. I'm not going to say it doesn't do it down here, but just beware. It may or may not um, get that deep of punch color. Quick Fire Fab is... It's about the same height as the limelights, um, but it's earlier blooming like the other quick fires. It has the real um, tight mop head blooms. Um, the flowers are large. The florets actually have a very unusual uh, flower shape or petal shape, more like a cross. Um, and it's very strong stem, six to eight feet tall. It's a very, very nice um, paniculata. And I found this chart on um, the Proven Winter website. It kind of tells you the heights of your paniculatas. So if you know you have only so much space in your yard, um, it tells you also when they bloom. So if you want to have, you know, continuous bloom, you might have a quick fire and then, you know, you can have a, a bobo and then maybe the pinky winkies would be more in mid season. It will kind of help you as you design your yard if you want to have multiples to, to know which ones to get. And this one is a, it's called Moon Rock. It's a new one by the Easy Bloomin' series as well. It's about four to six feet. Its claim to fame is this lime green center on it and a very tightly packed flowers on the panicles. Um, it's a, it's an, it seems to be a nice one. I have not seen this one in the nurseries, but I have seen it offered a lot online. So it's a very nice one. And I have a few acknowledgements here of you know, pictures and information I've gotten um, to do this presentation and also some of our resources, but I'm gonna open it up now to questions and I'll just leave these resources up here. Uh, and Josh, feel free to jump in. I don't know if we got any questions. Josh, are you there? Hey, Mary. So Mariana, Mariana, Judy Smith asked if she should have full sun for limelight. Full sun? Yes. In the chat, yeah. Um, they would like full sun, yes. If they don't have full sun, they can be kind of leggy. Um, they would do better with full sun. At least six hours would be best. Okay, Mariana, I didn't realize I was muted there. So uh, <laughs> the most common question uh, actually that people call the office about and that uh, our folks had in the chat bots today was really pruning. Um, so can you maybe go back a few more slides? I think there was one slide on that planting slide that might be a good visual uh, where you can talk more on old wood, 
new wood? What are what are they going to look for when we're talking about old wood and new wood and where the bloom is going to come from? Um, this one you're talking about, this slide? Uh, yeah, I mean, really any of those. I mean, we, we okay. tried to describe it in the chat, but if you want to elaborate a little more and just uh, describe what they're seeing in some of these pictures, old wood versus new wood. Okay, so old wood would be anything that is from last from the previous season. So if and I don't know, maybe that previous picture is better. The the old wood tends to be woodier looking. Um, anything above that, which is you know pure green, that's called the new wood. So again, if we had a freeze or if you were going to take down old wood, and I don't know if this picture actually has it. I mean, if the old wood has nothing on it that's can be pruned out. Um, those I would just call dead stems. Now, I don't have a good picture of, and I'm sure if you have a hydrangea, you know what I'm talking about, that the tips, the stems are just brown, there's no leaves on it. You could take it down, take down the brown down to where there's a leaf. If there is no leaves on that stem, take it down to the base of the plant. Is that what you're talking about, Josh? Yeah, I think that's what most of the questions were kind of focused on was mm -hmm. new wood versus old wood, how to tell the difference. Um, and, and then there was another question that is probably uh, a good one here, which is if you don't know the type of um, mop head that you have, is there a way to know if it's remontant or non-remontant? I think I'm saying that right. Mm -hmm. If you don't know the name of it, there I don't think there really is. I mean, you probably learn quickly. Um, if you don't get another bloom after a freeze, you probably realize, oh, this is an old fashioned one um, that does not, is not a rebloomer. I don't think there's any particular, I mean, most of these macrophyllas, to look at them, the leaves look all the same, and the flowers, it's sometimes difficult to tell what they are. I think probably it's gonna be more of a real life experience for you to be able to tell, oh, I guess this one is not a remontant. I don't have a way to tell you. Yeah, just spend a spring and summer with it. And if it blooms more than yeah. that spring, window, <laughs> right. so it's probably a remontant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, let's see. There was a question on uh, propagation and I tried to answer it in the chat, but if you wanna talk on uh, propagation. Okay. Uh of course, remembering that these patented varieties are illegal. I was just going to say, <laughs> <laughs> these are patented. These people are getting paid by selling yes. these hydrangeas. You yes. can't just go propagating them. Um, but if you have grandma's old hydrangea that you know, maybe you're <laughs> selling the house and you want to have a cutting or something, how would they take it with you? Um, you want to take a cutting um, and have, it's so hard to show. I don't know if I have a good picture of it anything that I can show you, a leaf node where the leaf meets the stem. It's helpful if you at least can get two of those nodes. And what I would do, and we used to do this when we had this live, we used to have a demonstration on propagating these. Um, you know, take your regular potting soil, you can use uh, a root tone or something like that to, um, on the leaf nodes and get that underneath the soil line and plant it. And um, what I would do is take like a baggie over it to keep the humidity in and put a baggie over the, the plant. You don't take a cutting that has a flower on it, take the flower off. Um, and it will root eventually. Um, the other way to do it on a lot of these is by laying down a branch, which I'm trying to remember what they call it, layering. Mm -hmm. um, where if you put the branch down, the leaf node on the soil and put a brick or something so that that is in contact with the soil, it will root from that leaf node, which is a great thing to do if you, you know, after um, you put it down in the spring and you sometimes six, nine months, you'll see that it's layered, there's roots. You cut the, the, the stem off again between the mother plant and your rooted spot and then you know take it out and plant it and you would have another hydrangea that way 
But I think of all the plants, they're they're a lot like maybe a, an Althea or Rosa Sharon, where you could probably have success with that new wood cutting or the soft wood cutting and also the hardwood cutting or the, the dormant wood that maybe you're going to do in the wintertime as well, right? Mm hmm But again, no patented varieties. <laughs> right. No patented varieties. Um, well, I don't see many other questions that we didn't already cover in the chat or that we didn't uh, go over now. So unless anyone else has a, a burning question, you maybe want to take yourself off mute and ask Mariana. Um, if not, we'll thank you, Mariana, for uh, your time and the wonderful photographs and your experiences with all these plants. I can only imagine how many, do you have a, a ballpark number of how many hydrangeas you have in your garden? Oh, pfft, maybe 20, 20, 25, something like that. Yeah. And they're all different kinds. I've got, like I said, the paniculatus, the cursifolia. I do not have a climbing hydrangea though. So I did have the firefly for a period of time until the squirrels um, decided to take it out. Um, I need to get one of those so I cannot say I have all five of the, the different types. Mm -hmm. I actually have a different one that's called blue bunny. Um, it's a totally different type, not, it's not commonly uh, in the yard, but it's a unique one that almost looks like a peony bloom when it opens up, it's very pretty. Mm. Mariana, Mariana, can you say a little bit more about what you would recommend for a container? Which, well, which, variety, which variety? Which variety of hydrangea? Yes. Okay. And also you um, have a question about what kind of soil to use in the containers if you want to do both of those at once. Okay. Um, you're going to, I have quite a few, like I said, to keep my pink blooms, I use con, uh, a container and I'm looking for the more compact varieties. So, you know, the two to three foot size, not the four to five or larger size to plant in. And I try now, like I was telling you, I just ordered some plants. Obviously, the plants that you get online, they're in like a, a one quart um, size, you know, container versus like a one gallon or a two gallon. Um, you want to find a container that's at least uh, maybe two to three times in width. So like this one quart container, I'm probably going to use maybe a 16 inch um, pot. And I will probably, until it really gets going, I'll probably plant some annuals around it just so it doesn't look like this lonely plant with nothing on it. Um, now, if I were to buy, like I bought the Giddy, uh, it was in, I think, a one and a half or two gallon. It takes up most of the pot. That's probably in a 20 inch. Um, generally, I use the, um, the raised bed potting soil. It's a little bit heavier than just like container potting soil. Um, and that way, if it gets big and I decide I do want to plant it in the ground, I can always just take it out of the pot and, and you know, dig a hole and plant it in the ground as well. I don't know if that answered your question or not. Make sure you got plenty of drainage though too, but you don't want these to get super wet. Can you say something about the, a few times you see people who have really purple, uh, mop head mm -hmm. is that strictly done because of the soil some of it is soil and some of it is the actual cultivar has a, a deeper saturation color you know they bred that for a deeper color blue or an almost purple um so it's example? a little bit of both pardon me do you have an example of one that would be that way that i could search for a rave is very much like that um the hydrangea rave, the let's dance rave, that one has a very deep purple color. Um, I'm thinking that wee bit grumpy is supposed to be a deep colored one as well. Thank you. All right, well, Mariana, thank you again. Uh, this was great. And uh, for those of you that maybe came in late or something like that, we will get this recorded and put up on YouTube so you can go back and uh, rewatch it or uh, watch the parts that you missed. So thank you all for joining us. Have a great uh, Memorial Day weekend. And uh, thank you again. We'll see you uh, with our next one. Thank you all.